to have with me the national chairman of the Social Democratic Party, SDP, Sheo Musa Gabam. We're examining the 2023 elections in Nigeria stability. All right, uh, Alaji, now uh, these elections uh, brought so much bad blood and acrimony among Nigerians. For you, why do we have this development in our politics? First, politicians are responsible. I must admit this. Some of the terrible and treacherous, you know, uh, situation the country is going through, the political actors are responsible. Instead of uniting the country, they went on ethnic campaign, religious campaigns, dividing Nigeria, using all sorts of formats that are, that are very negative for the country. And that is why we are paying the price that we are paying today. And since there is no deterrence, this kind of situation will continue. When you allow lawlessness to prevail over the ability of the citizens to see reason and deal with it morally and intellectually, the country has to pay for it. If we do not solve this problem, this problem will envelop each and every one of us. This problem will overrun each and every one of us. Some of the things that have happened in the states, I have never thought ordinarily it would have happened. If you listen to what the former governor of River State have said, Amechi, you know, th those revelations are mind-boggling. You know, uh, th there are more that I hope it will remain classified for now, for the interest of peace, unity, and stability. But some of the things that have taken place, you know, a normal human being that is in control of his intellectual sanity, you know, would not have believed such thing will, will happen. That, uh, politicians should learn how to be patriotic, should learn how to love their country, should learn how to work together. President Muhammad Buhari, when he was elected into office for the second time, said that he will run a government of inclusiveness. This party supported him. He never did so. Rather, he, he was very uh, vicious on some of the parties that even supported him. The ability for him to seize the opportunity, be a father figure, galvanize the party, even call meetings of leaders or chairmen of political party, have an interface with them, discuss with them, they have the pulse of the country, so that collectively we can solve the problem of Nigeria. He decided to ignore virtually all leaders of political parties. Even when this electorate act was signed into law, he refused to sit down with leaders of political parties. We contributed immensely to shaping the 2022 electoral act. Now, if a leader of a country do not see any reason why he should sit with stakeholders to listen to them. And then the security agencies, it is only the IG of police that have made an attempt to sit down with leaders of political party, listen to them, have for hard information of what is going on. You know, it is difficult for anybody to solve the problem. You must agree that you don't have the monopoly of, of anything to solve a problem. You need quality input to deal with some of the problems. History record, record as such that Few leaders that have ruled this country, e.g. President Babangida, brought some of the best brands to drive the country. You know, during the Shagari regime, there was utilization of power. We believe that those who are privileged right now to be elected to lead the country must reflect back, must look at Nigerian history, Nigerian record, where we were before. You know, the quality of people that have struggled for the independence of Nigeria are not close to the quality of the people that we have now. Education... Is, is all over the country. A lot of people are, are well educated, but of course they, they push that aside. They went into regional, ethnic, and religious bigotry in their consideration, in their analysis, in their perceptions. And that is why today you cannot find somebody uh, of any tribe going into another state and contesting election because we are still moving in the way of primitivity instead of progressively moving the country forward as Nigerians. I would also advise that we should do away with indigenship in this country. You know, it is high time for the country to move on. And I hope that the incoming leadership will look into critical areas in the constitution that is creating this problem to deal with it holistically so that Nigeria can be the giant of Africa as being mentioned all over the place. If we cannot conduct election in the state peacefully, if a governor can use the advantage he has to bribe his way through security agencies and those all sorts of rascality, impunity, and recklessness, and then the system still recorded him and announced the result, it means that we have a lot of challenges that we don't know who will solve it. 
with the level of exposure that we have in every state of the, of the federation, you have a lot of professors. We don't have them before the independent, but we have them today. But still the quality of thinking and, and conversations are going low. It's a very shameful thing indeed. And I do hope that anyone that is in the position of power or authority will reflect back and see how do we move Nigeria forward. This is one of the most gifted countries on earth. Everything you are looking for right. is here in Nigeria. The natural mineral resources that is endowed in Nigeria is, is nowhere anywhere on earth. But our biggest disaster is leadership and then the followership as well. Someone that has been weaponized by poverty, you just seem that poverty to, buy, to, to give him one measure of rice and you take away his thinking. He take away his ability to see reasons. So it's a very terrible situation. I must admit that we are all responsible as political actors, media organizations. We are all responsible for dividing Nigeria the way it is right now. And we must learn our lesson to move this country forward. All right, Talaji. No, now, still talking about uh, some of the factors that shaped the outcome of the presidential election. Many say the outcome of the 2023 presidential election is a replica of 1993 when SDP won with a Muslim Muslim ticket. What impact do you think this will have on the polity? Well, you know, once you have a, a multi political parties, you are not likely to escape from some of these issues. If you look at the mathematics very clearly, those who want to win election, who are operational politicians, must deal with statistics. Those statistics is what will give them an idea where to pick their, their vice presidential candidate from. Of course, if the presidential, like Atiku Abubakar from the PDP, pick his running mate from the South-South. Now, we in SDP, our uh, presidential candidate was from, is from the southwest. The VP is from the northwest. Now, you can't do away with these facts based on geographical reality that we are in. So the Muslim Muslim ticket is based on the party challenges and factual analysis. What can we do to win this election? It's a far beyond religion. Those who are bringing religion is simply because they have lost out completely. Those who made me who I am today are not just Muslims. Majority of them are not Muslims. Those who contributed to who I am today. So for me to talk about religion or ethnic or regional issues, I'm doing a great disservice to this country. A lot of people contributed to who I am today. My, my loyalty is to my country. And the moment we deviated from this fact, you know, how do we strengthen our common objective? And if you look at the, the marriages system in our, in our country, the intermarriages that have ravaged this country, there's no individual that have the capacity to divide this country. And so if the options are limited, it means that we must commit ourselves to building a great nation. There is no flying man that can tell you he have no uh, uh, marriages relationship with either Igbo or Yoruba or any other ethnic tribes. And there's no Yoruba man that will tell you that the entire Yoruba people have not married either from the, from the southeast or from the north or from anywhere. So we, we are already mixed up by, by nature. And there's nothing we can do about it. Yes, those who are supposed to drive the process, to develop the process, are the drivers of dividing the country into these balkanized zones of religious, ethnic, uh, and regional thing for their own benefit, not because it has a national interest. There is no national interest there. So most of the campaigns, if you listen to them carefully, people campaign along ethnic and religious issues. You see presidential candidates visiting religious centers you know, driving their campaigns or religious ground or ethnic ground or regional grounds. I think th this thing should be dealt with in the Electoral Act or in the Constitution so that we can do away with some of these things and the process of disqualifying anybody who capitalizes campaign on religion or ethnic grounds if we want to build a very strong country that we can all be proud of. One thing is very clear. Our children, our younger generation will ask us questions that will be struggled to answer. There's no way, there's no two ways about it. Right now, even my children have been asking me questions that I'm struggling to answer them. Not to talk of in the next 10, 15 years. What, how do we explain this situation? How do we come about this? Was it that we are so daft that we don't, we don't understand our right from our left or our left from our right? Or is it a deliberate policy to keep on weaponizing poverty, expanding it so that people cannot have 
the time to think properly, to reason properly, and you continue to exploit the innocent people, the explosion would be uncontrollable. We cannot control it. We have seen a sign of NSAS. We have seen what, what happened even in this election in Kano State, where people take laws into their hands. We have seen it in Rivers. People take laws into their hands. And we have seen executive recklessness endorsing illegality, rascality at the level of, 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 of governors. So it, it, it's a multifaceted you know, you know, crisis that we could not manage. Uh, and I've been saying this. President Ubasanjo demonstrated capacity to contain excesses of governors. You know, because if you do not contain excesses of governors as a president, you will fail as a president. If you allow governors to do things recklessly the way they want, take away the resources of the state without any deterrence, there's no way Nigeria can move on. So whoever that is the president, for his, at, at this instance, President Bola Chinibu must understand it is beyond just a freedom of expression. Every freedom is a limited freedom. If you go into somebody's environment, violated his freedom, take away his right and privilege to survive, then a natural thing to do is to take a decisive action. Leadership is about biting and blowing. Once the law is being violated by whosoever, nobody is indispensable, the law must take its course. That is the only way we can fix this country. A president must take tough decisions that will serve as a lesson to others. So I hope and I pray the president-elect will understand this and will deal with these issues decisively. The era of recklessness should be gone completely. Any governor who violated the law, uh, the, the, the issue of uh, impunity, I mean the issue of immunity should be reduced drastically that people can face consequences just as in other developed societies. All right, uh, because you talked about uh, the president-elect, which will lead me to my next uh, question. You advised the president-elect, Ashraj Bola Ahmed Tinubu, to fast-track development and reconciliation in Nigeria through a government of national unity. How achievable is this? It, it, is, it is very possible. You know, there are discretionary powers of the president. The, the cabinet formation are discretionary powers of the, of, of the president. The entire appointments of board, parastatus, agencies, heads of presidents are discretionary powers of the president. Now, bringing everybody together doesn't mean that there must be an appointment, but you must also create a conducive environment for people to feel a sense of belonging, for people to have access to food. You can develop the agricultural sector, you can develop the mining sector, because redundancy is contributing to what we are having today. There are sectors that are virgin. Our agricultural sector is still very virgin. The mining sector is very virgin. The, 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 what do you call it, the IT sector is still very virgin. Look at most of the areas that you can see developed countries are going into is still extremely untouchable in Nigeria. So those fronts, the president needs to open them so that our younger generation can be engaged. Redundancy can be taken out of their head. People to use them will no longer be visible because they are engaged, they are productive, they are earning a living to help themselves, help their family, help their parents. And then some of this anarchy you are seeing being funded will automatically fizzle away. So it's not just about appointment. It's about opening the economy, allowing the economy to function. Invest in heavily in sectors that will take away hunger. Nigeria can feed the entire African countries. Today we are struggling feeding ourselves because of recklessness, because of wrong policy, and so on and so forth. Like I've said, if he, he committed to it, he would do it. And then every responsible Nigeria will support that program that will enhance our economy efficiency, that will enhance viability of our, our, our citizens, prosperity of our citizens, and then you will not find it again. During military regime, virtually every policy of government is being taken to the doorstep of every community. If you remember the, 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 the Mamsa period of General Babangida, it's a military administration. Where is the Mamsa today? Where is the National Orientation Agency? For example, this currency saga, has it been taken to the doorstep of the community? Our citizens, were they allowed to contribute? We all wake up and find out the decision has been taken. And the president was saying, I have blessed it. The minister of finance says, I'm not aware of it. I've never seen this kind of disconnect in leadership uh, in the history of Nigeria. It's so obvious, it's so factual. So I'm sure the president-elect, there are facts on ground, there are material on ground for him to use immediately to whittle down the tension that have ravaged the country. All right, so what will you consider uh, the biggest challenges facing Nigeria that will require urgent attention by the president-elect upon inauguration? 
Number one is security. Any country that is suffering from security challenges will not avoid economic consequences because even the local investor will not invest in an environment that is very violent, that is driven by bigotry, ethnic or religious considerations, which means that fundamental responsibility of any president is the protection of lives and property of Nigerians. That is number one. Number two, you must create the political environment for the investors to come in, both foreign and domestic investors. The environment must be friendly so that investors can feel safe to fly in their capital into the country, create jobs. Again, one fundamental thing that he needs to do to ensure the safety of life and property, the government must engage into technical, uh, I mean, uh, 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 creating jobs by developing manpower skills. It is a shame that we are importing design clothes from even Senegal as a nation. If we engage designers in Nigeria, the president, in conjunction with the state governors, can train over 5 million fashion designers, can train over 5 million furniture finishing establishments, can train over 5 million uh, plumbers all over the country. They are daily needed can train over 5 million electricians all over the country. There are multiple of fronts the president can prioritize to reduce redundancy because redundancy contributes to insecurity. Some of these kidnappings are uncalled for. You see children conniving to kidnap their parents, kidnap their fathers, their mothers, their brothers, and their sisters looking for ransom. What is responsible for all this? Simply because people have no, no way to turn around. There's a completely abdication of responsibility by the federal government to inject virtually everything that is needed to stabilize the economy. The, the state governors are hijacking the state resources into their personal pocket. They call it my money, you know, you know, into state security votes. This should not be allowed to continue. You know, governors right. buying private jets, governors building houses like, like, like Villa, and, and security agencies are aware and it continues to flourish all over the country, and we want to have a good life, we want to give equal opportunity for everybody. So this aggression is going to take this country down if care is not taken. And I, I believe that if the president-elect is committed to peace, stability of Nigeria, he will do it. It's not a miracle, it's not a rocket science. He can do it. Right. We can solve our domestic right. problem. We have everything it takes to solve our domestic problem. Fantastic. All right. Alaj, because of time, let me quickly um, ask you my final question. You know, how would you rate the participation of uh, the youths in this election? Well, I, I can tell you that I'm somehow uh, disappointed because in the registered voters, almost 70 percent are the category of youths. Uh, youth, what I mean, youth, a combination of uh, young men and young uh, ladies or, 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 or this thing. Now, when you see how young men have compromised inducements, and these are same category of people that are calling for good governance. Some of them are graduates. They have traveled around the world. They have seen first class infrastructure all over the world. They have seen first class hospitals and some referral hospitals. You know, today, uh, they happen to be one of those that do not stand very firm, compromises the system, or behave in an ethnic or regional way, I, I feel, I can tell you, I feel a bit disappointed with, with such mentality. Oh. I do hope they will understand that the future belongs to them. They are the ones to shape the future of Nigeria. No matter how the elite want to shape the future of this country, if the youth are not supportive, if the youth are not cooperative, for jobs to be created for them, for posterity to be designed in a way that they will benefit from it, the future, right. will, the future will develop along with them. Then we, we, we are in for a bigger trouble because the, the level of unemployment will continue to rise because as they are, uh, once they complain, money will be thrown to them. They will fight over the money, kill themselves, and then they right. fulfill their future. This is what I've, what I've seen playing out. I hope they will, they, will, they will go back to the drawing board. All right, thank you very much, Elijah. I've been speaking with the National Chairman of the Social Democratic Party, SDP, Sheo Musa. Gabam, as we examine the 2023 elections in Nigeria stability, it is a pleasure having you on the program. And I must appreciate your brilliant perspective to all of our issues every time you are on our program. Thank you very much, Elijah, for coming.
I'm most grateful. Thank you very much.